Hey everyone, it's Jim from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in Tube Lab number 76, we're going to take a look at one of my favorite twin triodes, the Sylvania 6SL7 GT. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Before we have a quick look at my favorite tube, one of my favorite tubes, I have lots of them, <laughs> we'll do a quick update on the global tube shortage. First off, it's not a tube shortage of every single type of tube. In fact, I still have thousands and thousands of tubes in stock, good quality tubes, ready to go. But the problem is certain tube types have a lot of pressure on them. The tubes that are selling the most are the vintage KT88 types, that includes the 6550, the EL34s, especially, 6V6, 6SL7, 6SN7, and 12AX7. Now, luckily, I still have a good inventory of 6SN7s, so I can hold my price for most of them. However, my large inventory of power tubes is almost completely gone. Even the Mullard EL34XF2s that I specialize in, um, I saw a run on those tubes. I've got, I have still some inventory because I had a lot of them, but um, they're going fast. And at the rate they're going, they'll probably be all gone by the end of April. Anyways, um, for many of the tubes, two types in the store, I'm able to hold my price. And I don't think gouging should be a thing. Uh, it's, we're in difficult times right now. Um, and uh, you definitely shouldn't take advantage of that, in my opinion. But the uh, common power tubes that I just listed, listed those, those whole sale prices are going up quickly. So as I restock, my prices are going up, I, I'd say roughly 25%. Some are going to go up more, some a little less, but let's say roughly 25%. And any sets of tubes that I sell that use quads of power tubes or pairs of power tubes, whatever, uh, they have to go up as well. There's just no way to avoid it. So that's the bad news. Let's get on to the good news. The Sylvania 6SL7 is a family of tubes that Sylvania produced. The 6SN7 is a lower gain or lower mu, spelt mu, of 20. The 6SL7 is a higher gain or higher mu of 70. Now, before the 12AX7 came along, which is a high gain twin triode oscill, it's in the same family as this, just, it's just a miniature nine pin. Do I have one lying around? No, <laughs> sorry. Um, but everybody knows what a little nine pin looks like. Boring. Um, but before the 12AX7 came along, this was the high gain tube of choice. In fact, the original RCA um, phono stage was designed not for the 12AX7 and later the 7025, which is just a, it's a low noise version of the 12AX7. And, um, and most tubes that are labeled 7025 are just bogus because as soon as the 7025 came out, everybody who made a 12AX7 all of a sudden called it a 12AX7 7025, <laughs> even if they didn't change the design. So watch out for that. Um, but before the 12AX7 came along, this was the high gain tube of choice. So it's not surprising that there are many, many, many types. And the Sylvania family, in my opinion, excels at a warm, rich sound. And if you like strings, acoustic instruments, vocals, that's what you're going to love. To, to bring it up to compare something that maybe you're more familiar with, um, the, the vintage mother EL34s. In fact, any good quality 
vintage EL34 like the Svetlana, the RFT, um, they all excel at that warm, rich sound. Now, these aren't power tubes, obviously. They're preamp tubes. And they're not amplifiers of current. They are voltage amplifiers. So they're always going to be in the earlier stages of a circuit. For example, in the R8 integrated amplifier, integrated just means it's got uh, a preamplifier section and a power amplifier section. But in the preamp section of the R8, this is the preamp. That's it. There's one on each channel, and that's the whole preamplifier. <laughs> Remember, the tubes are the amplifier. Okay. Boring. Okay, let's grab something even more boring, the data sheet. Now, we're just going to spend a second on it, so don't tune out. Data sheets are wonderful things. Now, believe it or not, I couldn't find the Sylvania version, but the GE is going to be the same spec, and it's a beautiful, clear uh, printout. So, um, here's your pinout. The pinout's identical to the 6SN7, and it, I would call it a standard pinout. Let me grab my other pointer. This thing's actually leaving marks all over the place. This one will too. <laughs> um, so, it's a twin triode, both sections. So, we have two tubes in one envelope, and both sections are identical. There we go. What are the key stats for this thing? Well, you can have a 12-volt version as well. Maximum plate voltage is 300, which is not that high, but it's perfectly adequate for, for preamplifier circuits. Power amps, you're going to see higher voltages. Plate dissipation is only 1 watt, which is also not that high. But remember, this is just a voltage amplifier. Let's go down here and look at at the voltage section here. Typical operation, class A. Plate voltage will be at 250. That's a very common voltage. And this is what we're really in interested in. Amplification factor is 70. So what does that mean? Now, on some data sheets, it's going to be marked mu 70. Same thing, gain of 70. You can say gain as well. Um, 70 means if we put 1 millivolt into the input side of this tube on the grid, we can get potentially 70 millivolts out, 70 to 1. 12A X7 is 100 to 1, 6SN7 is 20 to 1. 12AU7 is 20 to 1. Uh, E80CC is 24 or 27, I forget, to 1. Uh, now, do we ever get that gain of 70? No. That's your maximum potential gain. So, depending on how the tube is biased in circuit will depend on how much gain you're going to get. Okay, let's just spend one more second and we'll look at the average plate characteristics. Now, this is for a design... Wow, look at how that shows up on camera. Even... High def doesn't like all this, <laughs> all these lines. It's like, it's like wearing a really loud sport sport jacket on the news. Um, the cameras go nuts. At least they used to in the back in the day. Anyways, uh, many of you probably don't even know what a sport coat is anymore. But um, I've got a wedding coming up, and um, uh, it's time for a new jacket. Okay, right. I do. <laughs> you know, I can get, I can, I can get off topic easily. So. This is a design tool for, for me, if I'm designing the circuit. For you, if you're not doing any design work, the only thing you're really interested in is how linear the tube is. And this is essentially a plot. Both of these are sets of operating points. Um, this has lower, lower current, this has higher current up here. Or I think I got it backwards. This has the lower current, this has the higher current. Um, but basically this is a plot of the operating, actual operating points of the tube in circuit. So by looking at your, 
lines here, you can see how linear the tube is electrically. If the lines are nice and straight, up in the middle of its sweet operating points, and they're parallel, that's a very linear tube. Now, we're using words to describe mm, something that's like a physical object, but this is actually the electrical linearity. It's just plotted out physically so that we can see it. Neat, huh? Okay, enough of that. <laughs> okay, let's jump in and look at the tubes. So they're arranged roughly from oldest to newest. This is a very interesting version. This is a, they're all 6SL7 GTs. I think I put a mil spec in here so we could take a quick look at them. But I did a tube lab on the mil spec tubes uh, way back. So we're not going to talk much about mil spec. Look at the chrome on this thing. Now, inside here are two oval parallel plates. Now, these are offset and angled. or Yeah, they're offset angled. These are back to back. The, the rounds are back to back and the um, and the little flaps on the side, I've already forgotten what I call them, but anyways, you know what I mean, are, are face, the wings are facing out. Um, now, what does this tube remind you of? Well, let me go and grab a GTA, a 6SN7. I think I've got a nice one here somewhere. Hang on, it's coming. There we go. There we go. You see how, now this is a 6SN7, so it's a T-plate, but you see how the plates are back-to-back. -back. It has a fairly large chrome dome. This is actually a fairly rare mil-spec version. But the GTA also has, um, and I'm actually sold out of the straight-plate GTAs. Um, they're a high, high demand tube. But they have a, a really large chrome dome just like this. Those tubes um, all date from the 1950s. So I suspect that this does too as well. It's the same bottle type, same heavy chrome. They sound wonderful. They have the house sound, warm and rich, with some good detail. Um, let me just put this away so I have some room here. Up next, and I think I got these backwards. This should really be over here. There we go. So these are World War II vintage tubes. This is the first generation, I believe. I may have them backwards, but anyways, it doesn't matter. Let's take a look at them. These are gray plates. It's the same. Sylvania made the same oval, single-winged plate throughout their production years, but they changed whether the plates were up, down, angled, chrome down here, chrome on top. So those things changed. We're going to see that. These were all from the 40s and I think into the early 50s. And these are wonderful sounding tubes. But the earlier version is prone to being noisy. Now, some of that could simply be because the tubes are now... Um, how old are they now? They are, they are 70 to 80 years old. And most of the ones that are still surviving are used. So it's not surprising that they're going to have a fair amount of defects. <laughs> you know, age defects, storage handling, uh, transportation issues, you name it. It's, it doesn't take a lot of work to kill a good tube that's 70 years old. So they may have been as reliable as the later generation we're going to look at. I don't know the answer to that. I do know that the the when I do get a, a real new in the box NIB, new old stock NOS tube in, of this type. They tend to be good. So it could just be that the used ones are just getting old. So one of the reasons why these older wonderful sounding tubes are so expensive is that the failure rate is so high. So if I buy 20 of them, I almost right away throw five in the garbage. And probably by the time I'm done my live listening test, I've thrown five more in the garbage. So that leaves half. <laughs> so that's a big expense, and uh, it's one of the reasons why early quality vintage tubes uh, do cost so much. Okay, so that's the gray plate. 
There's a black plate version just like it. Now, of course, with the waist chrome down here, that means the getter is down there, and it's hard to see, but it's a large plate getter, or let's say a medium-sized rectangular plate getter. And all of these, all of these tubes of this generation all have this sort of turned and offset plate design. You can see, actually, the mounting right here through the mica. See how it lines up this way and this way on an angle? Really quite interesting. And obviously there's a reason for that, probably because they're trying to reduce interaction between the sections. Remember, there's two tubes inside the envelope, both working at the same time. So they can interfere with each other electrically. So presumably orienting them like that was advantageous electrically. I'm sure it wasn't done for visual aesthetics. <laughs> okay, uh, here's the mil-spec black plate. Same tube as far as I know, but possibly it had a better spec heater or filament, same thing. Maybe it had made more chrome. That's a possibility. I see quite a few of the, of the Jan tubes with a big heavy chrome. Now, all that does is help maintain the vacuum, but when we're dealing with 70-year-old tubes, that's a good thing, isn't it? Because, <laughs> of course, once the vacuum is gone or gets weak, the tube is finished. It, it either is dead or it dies very shortly afterwards. We already looked at this big chrome guy. This is the next generation. So the elevated plate is now down and the getter is now up. And these had these beautiful large chrome domes. They're not that common. Um, and they're in the same family, the same sound, same warm, rich sound with good detail. And in fact, the Sylvania 6SN7 uh, has very much the same sound. So uh, a s similar tube, different plate structure, but a similar tube, similar materials built at the same time in the same plants. It's not surprising that the sound is similar. Here's a later version, another one with the yellow label, and they had smaller chrome domes. Maybe they got better at applying vacuum. Maybe they realized they didn't need as much chrome. Maybe the metal got expensive. This is uh, boron, I believe, is the metal. Maybe the metal became expensive. <laughs> um, but it's the same sort of arrangement of plates, different location in the tube. These, these are, of course, are called tall boys. I love tall boys. I think they're just sexy. Um, but, you know, guys like big, tall things. So that's just the way it is. Um, and what I think is the last generation is this short little thing. Same plates, same angles, uh, and basically the same sound. Uh, if I was to give an edge to the better sounding Sylvanias, I would go back in time. Well, yeah, back in time to the earlier ones. But the trade-off is the earlier ones tend to be have a higher rate of noise. The noise floor tends to be a bit higher than the newer ones. And we talked a bit about why that might be. It may not have anything to do with the generation construction. It might have just everything to do with how old these poor tubes are now. Um, anyways, um, and the reason why we're talking about what is essentially an obsolete tube, there's very few of these being made new anymore, is that some amplifiers are still using them. So the Wilsonton R8 uses them as the preamp tube, and the, um, the with, without a good preamp tube, the Wilsonton is just, it's going to be flat. I mean, that's just what it boils down to. If you have um, if you have an integrated amplifier and one of your stages, your key stage, is your voltage gain, which is, of course, the 6SL7, uh, if, it's, if it's a poor choice, a bad tube, uh, a really flat-sounding tube, well, that's the sound that carries throughout the amplifier all the way out to your speakers. Okay, so what's happening over at Melatone Kits? Well, Charles is working on getting the CNC machine up and running so that we can start to make production runs of the plates. And the last two 
Test Builder Uriamp kit amps have been shipped this week. The Uri has turned out to be a relatively problem-free build with even a group of teenagers successfully completing one as a class project. I knew I was going to trip over that S. So the Uri is now available for sale to anyone who wants to experience the magic of Class A. Pure Class A. And another E80CC test builder successfully completed his kit. He struggled a bit as he learned what he was doing, trial by fire, but persevered and triumphed in the end. Here's the amazing review he left in the store. The, this E80CC preamp kit build was an absolute joy to put together. I am a complete novice, no prior experience at all, just an enthusiastic audiophile. The videos and the customer service is great. I felt like I had a friend walking me through each step of the way. Now that I finished and started listening, I was just stunned and needed to take time to articulate how amazing the changes are. I'm an owner of the Wilsonton R8 integrated amp. The synergy between these two components is unbelievable. Sound stage is deeper, taller, wider, and more holographic. Instruments have more weight and density to them and are floating effortlessly. The music is so much more dynamic and exciting. Explosive, <laughs> he writes with an exclamation mark. So much less compression between the soft and the loud. That's an interesting thing. Uh, I'm editing here, so. Clarity, the music is just bigger and fatter and has more weight to it. I've never heard such detail in the bass and clarity with acoustic music. It's live, evolving, and emotionally engaging. Spooky good. Top tier for sure. It gets my highest recommendation. Exclamation mark. Wow, okay. Now, given how he struggled to, to finish up the, the preamp, um, that's an amazing review. Uh, I couldn't ask for a better review. Now, what he's just to clarify, what he's doing is he's driving the R8 integrated amplifier with the pre in, and that's a fairly common thing for audiophiles to do to put a high end or high quality preamp in front of an integrated amp. Don't ask me what's going on, I've talked about this before. Audiophiles have known about this for years. I mean, I go back 40 years, and uh, people were doing it back then. And uh, it um, it just it, Paul at PS Audio even did a show on this. I think one of his little YouTube's Paul Paul at PS Audio is just great. His his YouTube's are just wonderful. He shares a lot of the basic um, experience as a listener that is required for critical listening. So he's well worth listening to. Um, but it's just a thing. It doesn't work with every amp, but with the R8, um, I've done this, and um, it it um, it just basically improves everything. And maybe the R8 needed a little something to to give it a kick in the pants, to bring it alive. Who knows? When it comes to deciding what's going on, what is important in the end is what you are hearing, not necessarily what logically. Uh, what should work logically, or um, even what the electrical tests are. It, what matters at the end of the day is how does it sound. And that's something that is hard for me to do because I like my numbers. <laughs> I like to be able to put a number on something and say, well, that should sound better, shouldn't it? Well, in many cases, it doesn't. So trust your hearing. If you like how it sounds, or you can hear a clear improvement using a different setup, then that's the one that you should stick with. You found Nirvana. <laughs> or you're heading in the right direction, let's put it that way. Okay, what came in this week? Well, one of the reasons why we talked about the Sylvania 6SL7 is I literally sold out. It's a really high demand tube, and I got lucky. I was able to find a whole bunch, so I restocked, and there's some nice match pairs in the store. And I even was lucky enough to find things like full flights. 
I never find full flights of the Sylvania 6SL7, but I did this time. And um, so they're in. And I've been bringing in some power tubes. Um, so some RFTs arrived. So there are some sets in the store. But as soon as I put stuff like this, these EL34s in the store, they start selling right away. So by the time you watch this, they may be gone. I don't know. I, I had enough that I was able to make a set for the Wilsonton R8. Right. Um, and some more 6550s came in, thank goodness. Uh, as many of you know, this is one of my favorite KT88 types, especially in the R8, but I have a feeling that the lovely mid-range of these uh, probably carries through to most amps that you would plug it into. I had enough of these to put uh, separate sets in the store and a set into the Wilsonton's um, packages as well. And I've got more, I have more of these power tubes coming. Um, how long I'm going to keep finding inventory, I don't know. But, and, you know, as I talked about earlier, the price keeps going up. Okay, well, if you stay to the end, we're still running discount codes. I actually got an email from somebody asking me if he could still use a discount code. And th these codes are meant for my loyal YouTube fans and for my returning customers. And I can always tell who's a returning customer because they use a discount code. And that is absolutely great. It helps you out. It helps me know who's coming back. And remember, I've got flat rate shipping of $20 around the world. And the shipping is free if your order is $150 or more after discount. Have fun, everyone. This is Jim from Vowels and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.